The state, justified primarily by ideology, began as a religious institution. This makes sense when you realize that the very first states had to convince people uh, that people who didn't pay the tax or tithe should be killed. And they had to convince people of this de novo. It's not like today where there is tradition and inertia. They actually, uh, they had to actually convince people of the basic nature of the state. And we can thank religion for getting this ball rolling. Though it's not quite religion as we know it today, more like a cult. The state makes many complex rules which lead to the formation of institutions, and these rules are simply enforced by violence at the margins. The idea that the state supports social cohesion is laughable. A voluntary institution where people choose to pay leads to real emergent cohesion. Forcing people into a program leads and will lead to discord and hatred and violent resistance. And Americans, I believe, maybe uh, next year, maybe in 20 years, I don't know, but Americans are going to pay a very high price for their fantasies. If you think Americans are paying a high price for their delusions now, you're wrong. There's going to be hell to pay, and universal health care is going to be the violinist on this Titanic. Anti-statists generally don't want to live in atomistic isolation. There are some hermits who do and are disproportionately attracted to libertarianism because of it, but by and large, anti-statists are highly social like everyone else. Humans evolved in groups, and that is precisely you don't need a state to violently force people to group up. What's more is that these state groups and subgroups are completely arbitrary and way too large. But humans are so naturally collective that they can sometimes find ways to make these artificial groups work, even though there's a great deal of discord within these groups. Kind of like how two kids getting in a fight at a school are able to uh, continue to muddle along through the school year just because humans are so adept at social interactions despite being forced into a chamber with people that they hate. When one says, smash the state, statists generally view this as, smash the community, which would lead to a world of atomistic anarchy. The irony is that this belief prevents the formation of true communities, because today, how and why would a community work together? Utilities are managed by politically connected, semi-private, or just outright state firms. Roads are managed by agents of the state. Education camps are managed by agents of the state. Police are managed by the state. High taxes means that people don't have the resources to form these community programs, and the high taxes pay the state and corporations to do these things, leaving very little uh, need and necessity for the community. Remember that as soon as you get much bigger than 200 people in a community, which is Dunbar's number, people start not caring about each other and start forming cliques. That's about when a community needs to split. Each person can only conceptualize about 200 people as actually being people. And that is, and 200 is about as big as voluntary socialism can go. Once you get, and it's not, you know, it's not like the 200 first person, then it ends, but around 200 people is about the upper limit of a voluntary socialist community. Anything larger than that has to be, uh, has to be a state with force at the margins. And so to say that the state has anything to do with the community is just retarded. 300 million forced into a community? Many strain to make it work, having a vision of America, but it won't work. And the extent to which America, the state and the idea, has been quasi-functional for so long is a testament to how incredibly robust people are that they can succeed while believing in such a dysfunctional story. And when people live in much smaller and voluntary arrangements, each of these communities must interact and trade with everyone else. Just like small states, a stateless society would have no option but to engage in free trade and to abandon these dark visions of self-sufficiency and protecting American jobs, all that hokum. When I breathe, I understand that I am not planning something or deciding something. Everything needed to take a breath was already in place. Atoms formed molecules, formed viruses, 
formed cells, formed tissues, formed organs, formed organ systems, and organisms. How is this brain so complex? Through calibration, emergence, evolution. Humans got together, specialized, and formed a division of labor with long-distance trade and developed writing all before the state came into existence. This is how growth in life happens, by humans interacting in this way. It is how the Industrial Revolution happened. The states and the churches opposed industrialization, even publishing horror stories about the work conditions in the factories at the time. And uh, we now benefit from the Industrial Revolution that states not only didn't enable, but actively opposed. There is only one way for the betterment of humans, and that is through understanding the organism system and recognizing that attempts at controlling these organism systems, even if they are nominally supported by the majority of the organisms themselves, does not work. This is not to say that everyone should be converted into a standardized mass man. It just means no state. It's not how the body works. The brain doesn't act as the state. The brain acts more like the wise man in the village who everyone else trusts. The brain sends signals and body parts will comply as the brain has proven through tens of thousands of years of evolution to be worth its weight. And the dominance of the state throughout history doesn't prove that states are necessary, just that the state has been a very persistent fantasy. The state has proven itself very good at replicating and continuing itself. Religion and slavery also dominated for quite some time. And that said, and I hope the listener agrees with me, but all that said, the state of the society is not something to be decided upon. It's coming. Weaponry is getting too advanced too fast, and maybe it will be 10 years, maybe it'll be 20 years, but briefcase nukes are coming. And as soon as briefcase-sized nukes proliferate, that's it. No longer will the majority be able to simply quash the unwilling minority who is forced to buy state services. By forcing everyone to pay, the state will then have to satisfy everyone, and that is, of course, impossible, and it will end. But before that inevitably happens, let us plan ahead to make the transition from the collapsed state to uh, the new age better. Even if you love the state, you think it's a social contract, think that it's necessary to solve commons and free rider problems and provide public goods, and that taxation isn't really extortion, it's still going down. So if you think this whole emergentism thing is crazy, whatever, man. Whatever. You know, fine, it's crazy, but it's coming. Anyway, and no, there's not going to be a fucking vote. So you're going to have to make it work whether you like it or not. And besides that, there's only one way for real growth, but eventually there will be only one way, period.